representations of the central bank's messages. The chances of this happening are improved if you're, if you're well informed and the nature and complexities surrounding the conduct of policy, of monetary policy. The monetary policy is not only guaranteed to enhance this awareness, but also to serve as a platform to strengthen dialogue between Bank of Uganda, the media, and other stakeholders. This will be pivotal in providing relevant feedback about the policy choices the central bank makes, allowing for continued improvement. I am confident that at the end of this breakfast forum, we shall all leave more empowered and enlightened. It is now my honor to invite Dr. Adam Mugume, the Executive Director of Research and Policy at the Bank of Uganda, to make the main presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer session. I wish you all fruitful engagement. Thank you for listening to me. Dr. Mugume, you're welcome. Uh, good morning. Uh, my job is, uh, is simple. I'm not going to read the speeches like in DCOM. I'm only going to talk about uh, economics. And this is about basically monetary policy. The pre uh, presentation is mainly under five assumptions. The first I thought would first uh, go, what is the monetary policy objective? In other words, what is the basis of what, of what Bank of Uganda does? Where is it based? And the second, I would look at how do we do it, the conduct of monetary policy in Bank of Uganda? And then, based on that, I go into recent economic developments and the uh, uh, inflation mainly developments and then the monetary policy stance as issued by uh, governor uh, yesterday. Everybody, I think not go you much, everybody knows about the mandate of the central bank. Clearly the, man, the functions of the central bank is to implement monetary policy directed at economic objectives of achieving and maintaining economic stability. Now, so when we talk, that is based in Bank of Uganda Act. So when we talk about maintaining economic stability, the most important bit is to say price stability because uh, achieving and maintaining economic stability goes beyond uh, basically price stability. But if you look at clearly what the central bank is able to deliver, with its instruments, you can only talk about uh, price stability. I know there are many people here who believe that the central bank can do much broader uh, than price stability, but the answer is, if you give it broader objectives, you have to give it in instruments. It un only has one instrument, as, which I, as I will show you later on, and that is basically the money supply. So, when you talk about economic stability in the case of Bank of Uganda, basically we define it in terms of price stability. Price stability meaning what? Meaning that the average increase of the price level in the economy, prices of goods and services households consume, should really be around 5%. So that is the mandate. So why do we say price stability in terms of inflation? Simply because Inflation is a distortion. I, I know most of us here are young. We don't know what was going on in the 1980s and early 1990s when inflation was, uh, went as far as 250%. Now, okay, if you don't know the history of Uganda, 
do the same to our neighboring countries. Or remember what we were to being told about uh, uh, some years ago about Zimbabwe, when inflation was 1 million plus. So that is price instability. So in Bank of Uganda, price stability was defined as having an inflation of 5%. Now, simply because, as I said, inflation is a distortion, and the only thing that the central bank can do, really, in terms of uh, having economic stability is making sure that average level of increase in prices really is stable in the range of 5%. Now, someone can say, but why not 10%? Again, there are costs uh, we have, I have tried to list it there. Because the higher the inflation, the more distortion in terms of economic costs you, you, uh, you invite. For example, you are not sure, once inflation goes into a double digit, 10% plus, you are not sure, everybody will start get, trying to guess where are the prices going in the, in the, coming, uh, in the coming months of PTC. Higher inflation is associated with higher interest rate, nominal interest rate, is also associated with higher exchange rate depreciation. So for you to have inflation that is stable in the range of 5%, Indirectly, you are saying, I also have to maintain an exchange rate that is stable behind the scene. Because the higher the inflation, the more likely you are going to see the higher the exchange rate depreciation. Obviously, as I said, once you have high inflation, forget about private sector investment, for, forget about having money in a commercial bank, because the money will be eaten every day by the higher the inflation. So that's why in early uh, 90s, many people, people are, well, still people save in goats and cows and land, but those days when you don't know how the prices are going to rise, you'd rather have your goat under your bed rather than having money in, uh, in a commercial bank because the value of the money will be uh, declining every day. Now, as much as we can talk about the central bank ETC, and price stability. As I said, the central bank has no control over the supply. So when you talk about economic growth, when you talk about uh, level of economic development, the central bank has no direct control of, over growth. Why? Because factors of growth, if you remember very well of what we used to study in, in economics, factors of growth are labor and capital. The central bank has no <laughs> control over technology, has no control over labor has no control of capital, but it indirectly influences those through the aggregate demand, and basically through the aggregate demand uh, is the, uh, where, that's where the price stability comes uh, in hand. What is then monetary policy? In simple terms, monetary policy is uh, adjusting the supply of money. Now, think about the, uh, a case, uh, a simple case like this one. I don't know, unfortunately, it can't be seen. When, when, when you look at this graph, the vertical lines are money supply. If the central bank reduces money supply, you are shifting the curve, the vertical curve, inward. In other words, because the central bank inherently has the control of printer. It prints Uganda shilling. It can print more, it can print less. Once it has printed and is in saturation with the commercial bank, it can reduce it. So, and the demand for money is always negatively related with the price. So once you reduce the money supply, automatically interest rate, which is the price of money, will go up. So instead of talking about money supply, we can decide to say the central bank rate. So when the central bank says, I'm reducing the policy rate or increasing it, okay, in this case, increasing it, it inherently says, you are reducing money supply. Because as interest rate goes up, as the CBR goes up, given the demand for money, you are actually removing the money supply. So money supply and interest rate are the same. Instead of saying CBR, as we used to do in the before 2012, we used to talk about base money, money supply, ETC. Inherently, we are doing the same thing but now we are doing in something in the quantities rather than the price. The same story. If you want to know, if you go to the market to buy matoke, how do you know 
whether the supply has increased or, 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 or reduced. You look at the price. If the price has gone to 50,000, you know that probably the supply of Matoke to the market has dec decreased. The same story. Once CBR is rising, it automatically means they are saying I, the central bank is reducing money. Once the CBR is, uh, is reduced by the central bank, inherent we are saying I am increasing money supply. So the two are basically the same. So when we talk about therefore money supply, or sorry, monetary policy, in simple words, you are just saying control of money supply or adjusting money supply uh, to, to, uh, to achieve a set objective. Why do we do this? Simply because once you reduce the money supply, indirectly you are going to influence, <coughs> sorry, I think that's COVID. <laughs> Don't get scared. You are not near me. Okay, so in the end, we are saying that, well, once you reduce the money supply or once you have re increased the CBR, it automatically means that you are saying that I am reducing demand. So once you reduce the demand, because inherently you are saying I am also uh, uh, trying to affect the price level, the general price level, which is inflation. Now, we all know, as I just said, in the long run, output is not affected by changes in money supply. In the long run, uh, output <coughs> Sorry. is influenced by the factors of production. Can I have some water to kill the COVID? Or if you have COVID X, <laughs> so basically, uh, uh, that's the, the logic. So why I'm bringing this is to say, once you see that CBR is increasing or reducing, you know that the central bank is basically reducing or increasing money supply. And is doing that to achieve a set objective of affecting or impacting demand, which would ultimately feed us into uh, the price level. As I said, output in the long run is basically about the factors of production. It is not about uh, the demand side per se. It is the labor capital technology ETC that drives production rather than uh, the adjusting in money supply ETC. Now, monetary policy also, for example, we start with, thank you, we said the short term, I have already said uh, on this uh, chart that interest rate, I adjust interest rate ETC. Once I adjust interest rate, I'm reducing or increasing money supply in the economy. And to do that, once I give uh, more money in the economy, the more demand and, uh, in the economy. So once I reduce money supply or increase CBR, automatically I'm reducing money supply, affecting the demand in the economy. Now, so when, therefore, we are talking about policy rate, the idea is how, does it, how is it transmitted to the economy? Automatically, once you increase the policy rate or interest rate, which I have just described in the last chart, it influences the other market interest rate. It influences uh, the treasury bill rate. It influences the time deposit rates. It influences other, other prices, including the exchange rate, immediately. I don't know what, okay. But that, that influence from the policy rate uh, to the market interest rate, including lending interest rate, ECC, depends on the structure of the financial system. Now, many people say, but how come you have increased the policy rate, but the lending interest rate has not behaved accordingly? What about the structure of the financial system? In between there, to transmit the policy rate into all a, a spectrum of interest rate, you must look at your financial system. The more sophisticated, the more developed the financial system, the more easily the policy rate is transmitted to all other interest rates. So the same story. So you see, for example, once the policy rate, uh, in the case of Uganda, once we change the policy rate, there are some rates, interest rates that adjust immediately. They, what we call the interbank interest rate. How the banks trade between themselves. It adjusts uh, immediately. Exchange rate also adjusts 
but some interest rate like the ending interest rate, time deposit rate, ETC, normally they are sticky and also take time, more time uh, to be influenced by the policy rate. Once the market interest rates are, are, are affected, obviously the spending of the farms and the households will be affected. So you are moving from the policy rate, adjusting the policy rate to reduce or increase the money supply. It affects the market interest rate. Market interest rate will affect the spending behavior of the farms and households. So that is how we describe the transmission mechanism or monetary policy to the ultimate objective of influencing the spending behavior of households and the farms. So when we're talking about spending behavior of the farms and households, basically we are saying that is demand. That is the demand side. So by changing the policy rate through the market interest rate, market interest rate eventually feeds into the farms and the household behavior. And basically that behavior, normally once to describe that process, normally up to the spending behavior takes, uh, takes um, uh, on average around 12 months. So when you are setting policy rate today, like what the uh, governor did yesterday, it automatically means the impact, the full impact, will only be uh, influenced ultimately on household behavior and farms with a lag of 12 months. So that's why, therefore, it means that monetary policy has to be preemptive. Sometimes we take actions today knowing that they will influence the economy 12 months ahead. So once inflation is already up, you can't control it immediately with the actions today because monetary policy impacts the economy with the lag, and that's what we normally say uh, in, uh, in our jargon of what. So, basically, in, 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 uh, in light of what I've said, monetary policy is set with the future in mind. So you look at how the economy is evolving. That's why in the, in the policy statement, we, make a, we talk about the state of the economy today and the outlook and the risks after. So knowing that what the action you are going to take today will influence the imp sorry, will impact the economy with a 12 months uh, horizon, it automatically means that you have to look at a spectrum of, of risks, the outlook, how the risks are likely to evolve and make a policy decision uh, based on the outlook. Okay, BOU therefore has to make focus. So the actions like what the governor read out yesterday is basically about how we forecast the future of the Ugandan economy. How we look at the outlook one, one year from now, two years from now, five years from now, how is the economy likely to evolve? And therefore you take actions today. So we look at the future parts of output relative to optimal, optimal meaning basically how the economy would behave if everything was working well. And obviously the exchange rate. The difference between how the economy would behave optimally and today basically determines uh, the monetary policy stance. Now, let me look at therefore, given that background, how has monetary policy behaved? Remember, we started with saying the ultimate objective is price stability. So the first thing, therefore, to judge the central bank about is about uh, inflation. So if inflation target is 5%, how has Bank, uh, bank of Uganda behaved since 1993? I mean, you don't need to be an economist to see that at least over recent, we have done pretty well. Am I right? At least you can see the inflation target. Remember in 2011-2012 when inflation hit up to 25%, many people said Uganda is a banana republic, is a, a gold state ETC. And the, the data government emphasized, no, please give us time, inflation will come down. And indeed from 2012 we can see that basically inflation has basically uh, been uh, uh, below five, in some cases close to five. But in the history, now, in 2012, that's when we started with inflation targeting. Inflation targeting, that's where we started with now coming up with a policy rate. Before, 
before we were talking about money supply. Nobody would understand what we have done because we are saying we have increased the base money, we have reduced the base money, but saying that you have increased the base money, you have increased the money supply, you know, it doesn't make, you know, communica in, com in, communi in communicating, it doesn't make sense. But you can see that once we started saying the policy rate and the, uh, having the price stability in mind, at least you can see that basically we have been uh, close to where, uh, uh, where we wanted to be. However, not, that, not necessarily that if inflation is below our target, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are doing quite well either. <laughs> we are doing well compared to when inflation was, is higher, but ideally we should have an average inflation of 5% because that is our policy target. That is our medium ta uh, target. So deviation from 5 either way, obviously if this goes up, if it goes higher, it is a bad distortion. But if what I want is low, it automatically means that you are suppressing demand. The demand in the economy is suppressing it because inflation is, 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 is quite low. But overall, I think we can say that the central bank, in, I think in, in if, if not, I think in sub-Saharan Africa, Uganda has one, been one of the best in terms of uh, really managing inflation uh, to the extent that we have had an inflation of 6.1% since 1993. Uh, so in that case, therefore, we have really done quite well on inflation front. What about economic growth? Now, we have in mind also about growth. Whether you want it or not, Uganda's growth also has really been uh, quite uh, robust. If you look at from 1994 to date, the average growth is around 6.2%. Now, if you have inflation average of 6.1 and growth of 6.4, it is really, uh, you know, pretty, uh, you know, pretty good. In average for sub-Saharan Africa during the same period, I think was around 3.5, and low-income countries was around 3.3. So overall, Uganda, in terms of managing uh, growth and inflation, has really done well. However, many people would ask, but hold on, you have had the, you have controlled inflation. You are talking about economic growth. But I don't, I don't feel economic growth in my pocket. <laughs> Simply because as, as the economic growth goes into 3%, you are multiplying every year by 3%. So the number of mouths you are feeding in your household is also increasing. So you are dividing the same increase of your income in the household by, of six. And then you are also looking at the number of children or uh, whatever grandchildren you are, you, are, you are feeding. So that's why you don't feel the impact in your, in your pocket. So if, like now, in 2020, income, the GDP grew by negative 1.5. And you can see in, in 2020, that's where you see a bar, it was minus 1.5. Minus 0.5 automatically means that most households felt the impact. But on average, the poorer the household, the more impact they felt in their pocket. And remember that the poor household also have the bigger families. So basically, that's why there is a bit of a challenge. Imagine if Uganda population was 2% growth per annum, and you are growing in the range of 6%. So it automatically means that income per capita growth is above 4%. That means that actually, that's where you start feeling that actually probably in terms of household, there is a, a, a bit of improvement. So when you are talking about growth and you are not feeling the same impact on no, in your pocket, think about the number of the stomachs you are feeding. Basically, that is the explanation. So the more mouths you are feeding, the less income you are likely to also to be uh, to be feeding in terms of the welfare. But overall, leave alone the packet pass story ETC. I think also on the growth front, Uganda has done pretty well in terms, so we have managed to control inflation, we have also really stimulated economic growth. Someone would ask, but look, if you look at this chart, it looks as if from 2012, from 2012, uh, the growth to 2021, growth has not been as strong as in the previous period. There are very many reasons for that. Obviously, 
1994-93, you are coming from a raw base. When the economy had already been destroyed, ETC, so you had a buoyancy because you, from the raw base, you are growing very fast. But as the economy, obviously, the economic level stabilizes, growth tends to come lower. But also, you can also see there are very many shocks within the system. 2011, 2012, you know what was going on. 2016, you know what was going on. Do, does everybody know what was going on? <laughs> that would be another lesson. Paul of Charles, I think, is, knows much better because he normally writes about those things, uh, political economy aspects. Uh, 2020 is very clear, uh, COVID, ETC, but we know very well work to work. Is it work to work? Yeah, it was, I think, work to work. Uh, those aspects, ETC, have an impact on the economy. The negative sentiments, is it work to work, whatever ETC, and uh, associated sit on the fence, you don't do investment ETC, or when people are not in the gardens, they are looking for money uh, behind the campaigns. All of those have aspects, have impact on the GDP growth. But overall, I think looking at the history, we can equally say that we have really done quite well. Now, let me turn, turn to recent economic development. Given that history, now we still have to say, okay, how do, how do we assess the economy now? And therefore, how, after assessing the economy today and making a projection of the future, we end up into the monetary policy stance. As I said at the, from the beginning, the first impact of the monetary policy or is on short-term interest rate, seven days. That's the first step. The way this seven-day interbank rate follows, mimics the policy rate, means that actually the uh, uh, monetary policy is really effective. So once the CBR is adjusted, it automatically feeds into uh, the seven-day interbank rate. The seven-day interbank rate is how banks trade between themselves with money for seven days. And this money is uh, no, 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 no collateral. So how they treat, uh, trade uh, cash between themselves is the, is the seven-day rate. So once the policy rate is effective, the short-term or the way the banks trade between themselves in short-term um, short liquidity must be close to CBR. And this is what you see uh, on the left-hand side. Now, what about other for, uh, interest rates? That is the other, uh, the other aspect. The other on the, uh, the chart on the right hand. You can see CBR, the black line. You can see 91-day Treasury bill rate. You can see 364 uh, Treasury bill rate. You can see time deposit and lending interest rate. And I think, as I said, the most difficult uh, thing for uh, Uganda has been the lending interest rate, which is the red one. You can see that all the other rates are around the CBR apart from the lending interest rates. And remember when the late governor wrote to commercial banks asking them why they are not responding. Why is this lending rate, the red one, not as close to the other rates? You can see all other rates are basically crowded around the policy rate. So which means that the policy rate is feeding into all the other rates apart from the time, uh, sorry, apart from lending interest rates. The lending interest rates obviously are affected by different things beyond the liquidity. Whether you supply more liquidity, whether it's whatever it is, there are very many other structural impediments uh, that affect uh, the lending interest rate. You can think about it. How many, if uh, you go and borrow money from a commercial bank and you deny that you never borrowed, what do you think the, the commercial bank will do? It has to make sure that now anybody who comes to borrow has to pay for your sin. It is, it is a system. So you, a commercial bank has money from a depositor. So if you go and borrow and you don't pay, so another person who will go to borrow will pay on your behalf. So you commit a, a crime, your neighbor in, uh, also pays for, for the crime. So basically that's the issue. If you go to, if you have, if a commercial bank gives out a loan and you, are, you default, how many years does it take to resolve the, uh, the case in the, in the commercial court? 
it will take probably five to ten years. There are some cases as old as what? All those, therefore, will mean that now whoever else will come to borrow will pay for all those court cases, etc. There are issues like, say, fraud is in the, in the, in the, in, I know many people in Kadaita Commercial Bank is here. They don't like telling us the story about how much has been the default ca uh, defaults. People stealing from commercial, uh, uh, from commercial bank. Every day they are very significant. So, how do you think commercial bank is going to recoup <laughs> the lending interest rate? All those aspects, the cyber security issues, all those issues, it is uh, go into the lending interest rate. So beyond the policy rate, beyond the liquidity, then you also have other structural issues that impair the lending interest rate. But overall, uh, the good aspect is that beneath lending interest rate tend to be sticky. You can see that at least from 2020, uh, 20, around 2012, 2012, 2016, at least you see that there is a gradual decrease in terms of lending interest rate. Now, people would say, but you see, uh, again, political economy aspect. Many people say, no, why, you know why lending interest rate don't come down because government doesn't have a commercial bank. Is that the case? Go through about it. Because it would automatically mean that government institutions would be charging lower interest rates today. You know the government institutions you have? I don't want to mention them because I'm told that I'm not supposed to mention any is a crime, but you know them. You know government institutions. Do they charge lower interest rates than the so-called foreign banks? The answer is not, not necessary. So it depends. There are very many other issues that go in. So even if you have UCB bank, it does not necessarily mean that the lending interest rates will come down. That's what I mean. <laughs> That's a fact. Because there are very many other things that are going into within the economy. Okay? I... I I think I challenged the last time I, I, when I presented the, uh, my boss to the parliament, I said, but why do you complain about a lack of government institution? Why don't you create one or merge all these institutions, government institutions, Pride, Post Bank, UDB, into one giant institution, and then compete with all these others to see whether the lending interest rate will come down? Another political economy aspect is, simple, think about it. A UDB renders at 8, 10%. Money comes from the tax revenue. So compare that with a commercial bank that is going to mobilize the depots, pay 8%, and rent the money. So who is cheaper? I, I, you don't need to be an economist to really think through. You will see that basically, me, I ha I'm a commercial bank. I'm mobilizing a depot. I am paying time depots of 8 9%. Another one, and lending at 15%. There are commercial banks that lend at 15%. But another person gets the grant from government and lends at 8 10%, even 12%. So at the end of the day, yeah, it is, yeah UDB is cheaper, or this other development bank is cheaper because of a subsidy. Government has subsidized the credit. But not necessarily because you have removed the challenges in terms of high lending interest rate. That's basically that's uh, my argument. Now let me go to bad, a bad story on this slide. This is recent economic development. I've talked about how uh, this slide, how the policy rate has moved, seven day has moved, the other uh, interest rates have really moved apart from lending interest rate. But again, to continue with the story of lending interest rate, you look at how the lending interest rates are going, are becoming of these days. So the last chart, overall average quarterly lending interest rate, you will see that actually of recent, again, on a quarterly basis, the lending interest rates are ri rising. I think we see that I think uh, uh, in the quarter to December, average was 19.4 compared to 17.9 in, uh, in, uh, in the quarter to September. And basically, one of the reasons why we are seeing high lending interest rates rise, even when the policy rate has remained constant, is simply because of, you know, the pandemic and risk averseness. So everybody, remember, 
that even when we had the quality relief measures, uh, non-performing loans are there, but hidden. So if you, commercial banks start cap, uh, uh, factoring these ones in, then you, that's the risk of hazardous we're talking about. Raining interest rates then uh, are, are rising now. But also, on the other hand, uh, uh, per sector, you can see how each sector performs. One of the highest, and this is also shows you riskiness. A, a sector like agriculture, because of riskiness of the sector, attracts the highest lending interest rate. Now, that's why the government, in its wisdom, sought, up, uh, uh, sought about uh, SEF, agricultural uh, 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 credit facility, basically because these are lending rates by commercial bank, including SEF. Automatically, once you exclude SEF, our lending interest rate for agriculture are still the highest because of the riskiness of the sector. But again, you can see that the, the, that the sector that attracts a least lending interest rate is actually manufacturing, simply because manufacturing, these are big, are well established ETC, so the riskiness of manufacturing is less compared to, say, what we see in the case of agriculture. So overall, the story is here, yes, policy rate has remained constant, but again, looking at how the, uh, the banks are pricing their the money, it looks as if they are pricing in uh, risk, uh, risks uh, uh, associated with the economy, and therefore, a lending interest rate is rising. Now, this is the on private sector credit. Now, normally, in the case of Uganda, even when interest rates were 30%, people were still borrowing. They used to borrow, I mean, in, in, in early 2000, people were borrowing 28% ETC. In any case, I know most of you are too hoary. You have never borrowed from a money lender. But if you need, who has ever borrowed from a money lender, you pay more, more than 100%. <laughs> or if you have ever gone to a microfinance, microfinance are not cheap. They, they give you 48% if you are annualizing, isn't it? So basically, <laughs> When credit is available, people are willing to take it at whatever cost. That's the problem with the, uh, in the case of Uganda. But in this case, we see that of recent, private sector credit, this also has really been you know, very strong. In that it is not, it's modest. We are talking about private sector credit growth of 9%. If an economy is growing in real terms by 6 or 7% plus inflation, uh, it gives you about uh, 8%. A gross of 9 in terms of credit is really very low. Again, simply because banks are not lending, simply because of risk averseness, but then also there is a big brother they know who will come for money at the end of the day. You know the big brother. Who will come, and I say, in terms of security, uh, a government bond, now, normally banks start guessing like now, when the parliament approved the uh, supplementary of 3.8, they have been saying, okay, the 3.8, how is it going to be financed? It must be coming through treasury bills at any given time. So rather than then the person, why not speculate and wait to see whether the big brother will not come and take the money at 16% or 17% or 18% at, at no risk? So that is uh, one aspect. That's why you are saying that domestic financing requirement could be also an issue in terms of ha co having a less credit extension by commercial banks because they know they feel that probably the government will come and take the money. Now, at one time, there's one time when the government decided not to borrow at all. They had a supplementary and decided not to borrow at all for one quarter. Banks cried. So if the government now, this time around, they also want to milk the commercial banks, let them not take the money completely. Let them look for another source. You will see how commercial banks will start behaving. So they also behave knowing that, yeah, the big brother will come who doesn't care about the cost in any case, and therefore will take the money. So basically, overall, so the story we are talking about with the community development, we are seeing high rising interest rates but also private sector credit extension that is slow, and therefore that has an implication. Uh, not to, this is the sectoral distribution. You see that actually there are some sectors. Now we will see that commercial banks are willing to rent to household. Uh, they are not 
interested in lending to uh, the, the red bulbs. They are not interested to, to rent to agriculture. They are not interested to rent to trade. But they are also interested to rent to buildings and bit of manufacturing. Why? Simply because uh, in the personal loans, most of these are se secure, secure, salary secured loans, so there is security. Agriculture is a bit risky. Actually, this, the red bar includes SEF, agriculture credit facility. So if it was not SEF, obviously it would be much lower. The trade has been a problem because during the lockdown, trade was heavily affected. And the high, the high non-performing loans, we saw them in trade. So you will see that wherever there are high non-performing loans per sec in that particular sector, private sector credit also will not be going there. See, that's what we are talking about, risk averseness. If the commercial bank is not sure whether they are going to recover their money, given this an, a global uncertainty and domestic uncertainty, they don't give the money the, uh, to the sector. And that is trade and bit of agriculture yesterday and the business services. If you, because you are not sure whether the business is going to survive in, the, in a quarter ETC, so you can't give them, uh, the, uh, 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 sorry, a credit or so. So basically that is the, the story about uh, credit. But also, on the other hand, we see households interested in, in borrowing. You'll see that the loan, when you look at the value of loan application, as in the quarter to December, was about 5.2 uh, trillion. The how people application, applications commercial bank received in that quarter, if you sum them up, was 5.2 trillion. But commercial bank gave only uh, 2.9 uh, trillion. So the approval, uh, loan approval is on the right, uh, application is on the left. So individuals, businesses, households applied for 5.2 trillion in terms of the value of loan application. So automatically you can see the demand for loans is increasing. But when it comes to the supply is increasing, but at a very low uh, pace, because on average, if 5.2 uh, value of run application was 5.2, and allocation was 2.9, automatically means that around 54% of the run application got what uh, what is uh, required. So automatically, the remaining either were pending or they are taken not to be really credit towards it. So again, that tells you the risk of vastness of what the commercial bank are seeing in the market. And that has also has implications. Then, but someone can ask me, but hold on. If you say growth is rising, private sector is not as buoyant, then how is it, who is financing, who is financing the, the consumption? Simply because in 2020, households and businesses increased their holding of uh, deposits. Commercial bank savings, rose by almost 20% in commercial bank during 2020. In 2021, now it has dropped to around 5%. So they increased the saving during the bad periods of uncertainty. Now they are offloading. Offloading means therefore once they start the saving, they demand, or even if they demand and they don't get, the businesses still continue or households still consume because they are the saving. But there is obviously a limit to how much they can be saved. Now, let me t turn to the fiscal side, the fiscal policy. I've talked about uh, the interest rates. I've talked about uh, whatever. I'm going to be fast now. Sorry. The fiscal side. Fiscal side, remember, is part, government expenditure takes about 20% of GDP, of expenditure. So whatever government does in its expenditure has an impact on demand. So if it takes about 20% of GDP, or in, in terms of expenditure, then it is worth uh, focusing on. We see revenue shortfall of 800 billion, 880 billion in the first six months. We see government expenditure falling lower than what was programmed, simply because, partly because of raw revenue, but also be, uh, slightly largely because of disbursement of external loans has also been sluggish. External loans are dispersed per, uh, you know, depending on the progress of the projects. 
if the progress of the road construction, for example, is slow, the funders who are external also would disperse in a slow, in a slow pace. Basically, the external development aspect also comes always lags behind or falls below of what is targeted for because of the raw execution of some of the government projects. So there is a lot of slowness in terms of uh, execution of government projects. And the, the slower, the more slow execution uh, happens, obviously the, if, the impact of the economy also becomes low. Overall, you can see there was a fiscal deficit, but the fiscal deficit was financed by, as I, I said, partly in, uh, by the, uh, domestic financing from, uh, from issuing securities, but also from borrowing from the central bank. I know many people uh, say it is not borrowing, it is delayed payment to the central bank. Okay, whatever you call it, yeah, but it's, it's some, have some similarity. If, if I pay on your behalf and you don't pay me back for one year, how do I call that? Is it a loan? Whatever you want to call it. For me, as an economist, I call it a borrowing. So for you, you can call it another term. You can baptize it another term. But from my economic perspective, I call it a borrowing from the central bank. So we see that the government uh, borrowing from the central bank was that. By the way, there is no crime in borrowing from the central bank, provided the central bank doesn't do the printery. So every time you are borrowing and the central bank is printing, at, at the end of the day, <laughs> you are generating what, where we started from, and uh, inflation or whatever. And also the cost of mopping the liquidity. However, on the positive side, we see that the fiscal policy is on cons uh, consolidation stance. In other words, looking for where we are in 21, uh, 2020, 2021, fiscal deficit was around 9.1% 9 9 of GDP. This year, we are likely to see 7.5. So it means that fiscal deficit is uh, declining. Our target for Uganda is around 3%. So in 2020-2021, 9.1 was almost three times what we are targeting. But I think uh, gradually the fiscal projection indicates that actually grow, uh, slowly the fiscal deficits are going to be uh, uh, to, to decline and therefore uh, you know, having fiscal consolidation. The, the question is, once you do fiscal co uh, the consolidation, will it affect aggregate demand? Will it affect the development project? I think that's where there is a bit of a challenge. Data development, recent, we see, I, I, I know many people have been talking about Uganda uh, failing to pay uh, the Chinese loans, it is, that, that's, not, uh, that's not true. Our debt numbers at 49% of GDP, you know that global public debt to GDP is about 300%. Okay, so when Uganda we are at 49 percent of GDP, we have much, far, much bit now, that, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have room to borrow, no. <laughs> there are some countries like Japan, their public debt to GDP is 200 percent plus. America is one, ab above 100, but you can't reach America. Uh, the countries that have gone towards 100 percent and they have faced it, you know Zambia, uh, I think Angola, uh, Mozambique, Angola, and the country like Ethiopia, uh, had the uh, debt GDP of 80 percent, and is already negotiating for restructuring of the of the of the loans. Most of these are obviously Chinese, but the higher uh, the debt GDP, the more challenge you have in servicing the debt. Now, so the big number to look at in case of Uganda is not as a share of GDP; is that animal called the. Uh, uh, servicing the debt. Once you are serviced with the debt, in terms of paying back uh, loans and interest rates, you see that it is about 29% of tax revenue. So market means that out of 100 shillings, you are able to collect 29, uh, is it 29 shillings will go first in servicing the debt. Before you do the road, before you pay wages, Servicing the debt is the first priority. So that's where the number we should always focus on rather than talking about debt to GDP. Because debt to GDP in the case of Uganda is really not a big challenge. The question is how do you service the debt and without necessarily constraining 
the other activities that will stimulate economic activity. Uh, just to also note that, yeah, some of the, once we government issues security, some of these are held by uh, offshore. And now, the more, in some cases, uh, I think by October 2021, offshore guys were holding 12.8% of all government securities and uh, all government securities. Now, this has come down to 10%. So, automatically means that attractiveness of the interest rate or the yields, uh, or appetite for uh, domestic borrowing also attracts uh, 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 offshore guys or foreigners. Now, the risk part of that is that now because interest rates in USA is rising and other global developing countries, interest rates is tended to, to rise, now they're exiting. The more they exit, as we saw, uh, if some of you who follow economic news very well, we saw that in, uh, in October. When offshore guys started exiting, it caused a spike in exchange rate. And we ended up selling about three, more than $300 million to cool down the extent of the depreciation. Simply because, the, yeah, government borrows, the high rules are attractive, they bring offshore, but in the, eventually, in the event that there is a, a, sh a shake in the global economy, or they want to exit, it causes havoc in terms of exchange rate, and therefore you, have, uh, you start uh, selling the dollars. On the uh, parcel payment, I've talked about uh, government 25, uh, 20 uh, percent of GDP. But what goes on on external side, imports and exports, and the transfers are part of the aggregate demand. If you still remember, uh, aggregate demand is equal to household consumption, investment, government, and then external sector. So this is the one we are talking about. You see that external sector has exports. How are they performing? In 2021, including gold, we exported goods worth 4.5 uh, billion. This was compared to 4.46 billion in 2020 and uh, around 4.1 uh, in 2019. So overall, there has been an improvement in exports. Now, we try to remove gold. Why do we remove gold? Because basically we know gold comes from wherever it is coming. Not to gold of wherever, no, no. This one, that, it comes from somewhere else. So if it comes from somewhere else, the value addition is small. So once you try to remove, wash it out, out of the exports, the exports go to 3.3 .3 billion in 2021. But that is compared to, say, 2.8 billion in 2020. So overall, even excluding gold, you see that our exports have increased. Now, that's where we ha need to, uh, uh, to see like our traditional exports like coffee. Coffee has done well. In 2021, I think we exported about 6.7 million bags of, uh, of coffee. Uh, that is up from around 5, uh, 5, 5 or point something, 0.44 in 2020. So overall, in terms of value of exports of coffee, we see that a very, a very big increase. Uh, and I think that's really a government effort in terms of uh, stimulating exports, mainly the coffee. But the beauty with coffee also, international coffee prices have been attractive. In 2020 are uh, uh, increasing. However, also imports are increasing, and imports are increasing more aggressively. Bit of this increase saving, the we a bunch of imports. In Uganda, in another one. If it is made in Uganda, the value addition from Uganda's aspect probably is 1%. If we you, if you are like some of us who put on uh, knighted uh, shirts, those ones we know, yeah, at least it's cotton. I don't know if it's been in, in Rango, but at least we have some bit of uh, Ugandanness. But the rest of us, we know very well, that's the import. So as you rem <laughs> reduce your savings, you are importing from China. And basically, China is where the most of our import increase in a year by around 22% compared to exports of around 19%. So that, the difference between exports and imports is a deficit. So that deficit must be financed by something. Okay? Now, how do you finance that? You start looking at what, how is the travel receipts. It is increasing. In 2020, because of COVID, there we see a bit of an increase to around 960 
uh, 68 uh, million. So a bit of tourism more so is recovering. Workers' remittances has been resilient. You will see that even during COVID, we got a, a billion from workers' remittances. Uh, when we say workers' remittances, you know these people, some of them, unfortunately, who have died in, in Middle East. That's where the money comes from. It is not from uh, the rich guys in the USA. Most of this is come, now comes from Middle East. These young guys who have gone, uh, who have gone as made ZTC or security uh, guard. That's where a bulk of this one billion is coming from. So that's the one billion uh, we are talking about. And actually, it is recovering. It used to be 1.4 in 2019. Entry deficit. You are talking about travel receipts. You are talking about workers' remittances. You are talking about NGOs. All that combined help us to finance uh, the goods account. And obviously, also, the borrowing, external loans by the government, ETC. Overall, balance of payment is, seems to be improving uh, uh, compared, uh, you know, uh, in six months down the road or even one year. But again, it also depends on what is going to happen, for example, uh, uh, cost prices, where they are going to be depressed again, or whether international oil prices are going to continue rising ETC. But all from the external side, yeah, bit of favorable news, our financial account was able to overfinance even the deficit and therefore had a surplus to build the reserves. That's why we are talking about reserves in 2021 uh, going up to $4.3 uh, billion compared to around, I think it was around 3 point something in 2020. Overall, in terms of reserves, because of, of a, a lot of inflows that ha, ha, uh, go, go, go on in terms of financing the deficit, we see a, a build up in terms of reserves. It has FDI. I, I think I forgot to mention it. If you look at FDI there, oh, I never put it there. But FDI also is increasing. I think we are seeing uh, uh, in 2021, we're looking at an FDI of around $900 uh, million. And this is likely to increase even further due to uh, the, oil, uh, the oil, uh, oil sector investment. Look at a financing account. If you look at the oil sector development, if you look at the export side that is slightly more robust, although we have a strong demand, uh, sorry, demand in, aggregate demand in terms of for imports, but overall I think from the external side, we see a better picture than say in 2020 or other years. The exchange rate of yesterday, once you have a problem in the balance of payment, it spills over into the dollar. So once the picture on balance of payment is improving, as I have described, it spills on the, uh, the exchange rate. And that's the story. Many people have been saying, how come the exchange rate has been stable? What magic has Bank of Uganda done? No, it is not Bank of Uganda necessarily. It is how also the, uh, the economy is doing. This is reflective. If the exports are doing well, if automatically uh, the dollars will come and therefore it will impact on exchange rate. However, the another positive aspect on exchange rate is the positive, uh, uh, positive sentiment. Once offshore, once investors look at you as a healthy person, they are willing to bring you, the more healthy you are, the more dollars you are likely to uh, attract. That is basically the, uh, the story. That's why we say, like the example, during the days when we had to work to work, offshore guys exited. Many people, even Ugandans, would rather have moved from Uganda shillings and hold dollars and don't spend anything, simply because you have a question mark of even if people are willing to spend their dollars, even all, uh, foreigners are willing to give you, to bring in more money because you are attractive. You are, in, as a, an investment des, uh, destination, you are, uh, you are attractive. And therefore, that's the story about the exchange rate. However, the caveat is, the stronger the shilling, the more costly it is for the exports. So we should not always think about as exchange, ra exchange rate being uh, attractive as a good sign in the economy. No. It makes the imports more cheaper. So instead of looking at the domestic uh, produced uh, commodities, now the Chinese shirt is more cheaper because with $100, it's 
the more you hurt the other exports. And therefore, it is not necessarily good. It is actually encouraging import. That's where we are always talking about Dutch disease. That once oil revenue starts flowing, shall we be able to export beans and maize again? Or we shall only be talking about exporting uh, oil? And that's really where the danger is. Because as oil revenue starts flowing and exchange rates start appreciating, it doesn't make sense to, uh, to export maize because maize will be more expensive uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the foreigners. Now, let me turn to economic growth. Given what, has, what I've described on the government side, ETC, what about growth? Growth, as the, the uh, governor, deputy governor said yesterday, growth looks very, very attractive. If you look at the growth in three quarters of 2021, growth averaged 6.6%. Now, remember, we are talking about a contraction in 2020, a minus 1.5 growth, which is a contraction. So, for the three quarters of 2020, these are numbers from UBOT, not Bank of Uganda. So, for the three quarters in 2021, where UBOT has released the numbers, the average growth is 6.6. .6. Now, even if you, you are not a, a statistician or whatever, you just assume that, well, if we if the three quarters average 3.6, let me just assume that the, the last quarter of 2021, probably growth will be 3%. You will still have a growth of more than 6.5%, basically. So overall, that's why I'm saying growth in 20, uh, 2021 is much stronger than 2020. However, with the caveat that there was also a contraction of 1.5, and therefore there is a best effect. But overall, Given the scenario I have described, household expenditure, uh, oil uh, uh, investment, ETC, household saving, you will see that actually growth seems to be recovering well, even going forward. However, there are headwinds. Headwinds are strong. Number one, what is going on in the global economy in terms of oil prices is threatening. What is going on, your political tensions, uh, in Europe and whatever it is, is threatening. Overall, they are ahead. Uh, they are ahead. Uh, uh, winds ahead. But overall, we believe that in 2022, we should be able to see a growth of, a, of, of above above 6%. Slightly lower than 6, uh, 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 six or six or seven, but still a growth of 6% is, uh, is strong enough. Although with uh, risks. Now, when, now that's why I emphasize the risks. Because although you are projecting that the growth will be 6%, there are too many risks. Number one, as I said, your political tension. We don't know what is likely to happen. For example, if uh, they start a war in Europe, automatically it will feed into, into Uganda whether they want it or not. You have ever heard that when two elephants fight, who suffers? Uh, it is the local one. Okay? <laughs> Basically, that's what you are saying. So, yeah, they make their noise, ETC, it will come to us here, if, whether we are interested or not. Okay? Basically, that's the argument. And again, uh, another aspect we need to look at is that if interest rates rise globally, like the Americans, the way they are trying to, uh, they are saying, exchange rate will start, uh, you know, depreciating. Once it starts depreciating much faster than what you're projecting, inflation will go up, and what will be the response by the central bank? We tighten the monetary policy. Once we tighten the monetary policy, you are constraining demand even further, even when the economy, before the economy really stabilizes. So those are really the risks we are seeing in the horizon in terms of growth. Now, I turn to inflation uh, briefly. I think that's where we started from. Inflation basically looks, uh, you know, uh, moderate. There is no, we don't see any inflation development at least in the past, headline 2.7 in January, and you are talking about a core of 2.3. So overall, inflation, that's where we started from. Inflation is much even below the 5%. So, but this is water under the debris. So we are talking about inflation in January. As I said, this is, you know, doesn't help, can only help what is the outlook of inflation. It is only when you start looking about the outlook in terms of inflation that you start judging the monetary policy. 
where is monetary policy likely to go, not where inflation is today, but where inflation is likely to be in 12 months horizon. And this is basically the chart we are talking about. You can see uh, the blue line. Basically, the blue line, you look at the red line is the focus we had in December. The blue line is the focus we have in February. You can see all of them are pointing to the fact that inflation is likely to increase going forward. Why are we saying it is likely to increase? Of the factors we have already said, exchange rate could depreciate because of whatever goes on globally. We are talking about uh, uh, around the exchange rate. We are talking about food prices rising. We are talking about oil prices. Uh, the uh, price per barrel now is around $91 per barrel. Now, before, we used to think that it would remain between 70 and 80 So the more the increase, the higher the increase in oil prices in the international market, the, it, it is like it will feed into the transport costs. It feeds into the transport costs. It feeds into the production process do, uh, domestically. And therefore, that's why you're talking about inflation rising. Now, we could be wrong, obviously. Now, the assumption there also is that the demand will remain as buoyant as the way we are describing. It could be that probably we have uh, another lockdown. God forbid. Nobody wants another lockdown, obviously. Uh, you'd rather die of COVID rather than lockdown. That's <laughs> some people are saying so that uh -uh, this lockdown is, you'd rather have the, after all, this uh, Omicron is mild. It's just like uh, in, in Ankara, where I come from, there's, there's what they call tonto. Tonto is the brew from bananas, and then there's waraji. So this Omicron is really tonto. <laughs> the alcohol content is very small. <laughs> <laughs> but when the other one of, of 2021, uh, that was waraji, the real cassette one. And I think you saw what it did to many people. So many people say, ah, this, you know, this Omicron is really mild. So why, no, no, but supposing another heavy one comes on board and you have a series of, even if we don't have a lockdown, social distancing measures, ETC. I was surprised this morning when I was coming, I found the, a nightclub open at, at 5.30. I last saw that many years ago. I never knew that. 5.30 in the morning, we are still playing music on, an, on Entebbe Road. I hadn't passed there for many months since the lockdown. So you can see how people are really interested, not interested in lockdown. So you do whatever you do the whole night. I don't know whether how the regs hold up to morning, but <laughs> and you are still you are still sober. Really, Omicron should die. So we are praying that there is no do, you know let people do whatever crazy things they do, and therefore, if it happens that Omicron another round, whatever it is, obviously inflation will automatically come down because people will not be consuming. So basically, but overall, all things considered, we normally say in economics, we think that inflation should really is bound to increase as uh, domestic demand uh, rises ETC, although we know uh, there are risks to higher inflation. Many people are, are saying that, for example, the price of foodstuffs could go up simply because during the lockdown, many people made losses they produced the beans and maize, and nobody consumed them. Remember what we used to call Kobo Ebu theorem? If you produce and there is no demand, prices crash, so the next season you don't plant. So <laughs> it is when the prices start rising, then, then you start planting. But that is after a round of seasons, ETC. So that is also could feed into higher inflation going forward. So there are risks, as I said. One of the risks is... Uh, more depreciated exchange rate. You have, uh, there are some sectors that are not yet captured fully in the CPI basket, like service sector, because if the service schools have been under lockdown or bars have been under lockdown now that they are open, we don't know the price level increase on some of those sectors. So they are basically, on this chart we are talking about risks. And overall, the judgment is that it looks as if a balance of risks, once you look at the positives and the minuses, the one that, the factor that seem to be favoring higher inflation seem to be higher compared to the ones that favor the lower inflation. 
basically that is the assessment. So once you look at inflation projection, once you look at risks, it helps you to make a judgment where should monetary policy go. Should you tighten the monetary policy? Should you ease monetary policy? Should you remain neutral and wait for more information? So basically looking at gross pro uh, prospects and risk to gross, looking at inflation prospects or uh, outlook and risk to it, the question is, and we are not talking about today, we are talking about 12 months ahead. The question is, which, how do you judge the state of the economy and therefore decide on monetary policy? For now, we said, okay, and this is where, where I will end. Looking at all these risk factors, looking at the way the economy has evolved in the 12 months, looking at where it is going, then the question is, although there are risk to inflation, should you tighten the monetary policy now or should you wait? Why? Why should you wait? Because there are question marks about economic growth. There could be, there are very many unknowns. They, are, they call them, there are heavy men, unknown unknown about the economy. We are likely to see probably aggregate demand not recovering as fast as is. Also, although we are saying inflation could rise, but also could, could not necessarily rise given what is going to happen uh, to uh, growth. Therefore, the best judgment in our assessment was based on all that assessment was to say that monetary policy remains the way it is at 6.5%. However, Governor's statement was clear. Should the output gap or inflation rise much faster than what we are projecting, then obviously there is room for monetary policy tightening. Is there any room for monetary policy easing? In the discussion I have described, you see that any room for monetary policy easing seems to be really almost nil. Okay? Are there rooms for monetary policy tightening? The answer is, suppose inflation is the way we have been described. That's the way I hope I haven't bored you. Thank you. That's the end of the presentation. Another hand clap for Dr. Mugume, <laughs> who without blinking referred to all of us as a bunch of imports. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as we get ready for the next section, which is the Q&A, um, allow me to say it is good to see members of the media again. We had taken a break from the physical interaction, but it is good to see you again. Um, going forward, we are going into a question and answer session. Um, as you know, before how we used to do it, we shall have questions from the media addressed to Dr. Mugume or to any other departments that are represented here. We have NPSD, we have ACF, rather, sorry, NPSD's National Payment Systems Department. We have NBFI, which is a non-bank financial institutions department. We have the Petroleum Department, the Petroleum Reserves Department, and we have the Accounts Department, which has ACF, Agricultural Credit Facility, and we also have our Research Department. So, members of the press, editors, well, it is good to have you here. We have microphones going around. Please raise your hand. Uh, tell us your name and the media house you belong to and to whom you believe this question is addressed to. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll take the questions in rounds of five. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Wadilo Makanold. I work with Uganda Broadcasting Corporation. My question is just uh, quite simple, but to help set the pace. Basing on income per capita, I want to know what population figure are we working with. The URSB seems to be mentioning we are 41 million people by 2020, actually 2021. But uh, we find other figures actually almost peaking to 
to 50 million, 49, we, say, we see 49 million, we see 45 million. So what population are we basing some of these figures on? Thank you. My name is uh, Samuel Setum, uh, National Media Group. Uh, Dr. Mugu may help me understand this. I mean, I've been around these things for a while, but I've never solved this question. The value of currency. Uh, what money can buy over time seems to be corroded or eroded, whichever. So help me understand why that happened. And does that concern you guys who manage the economy at all? Or we deal with it as we go. The other question is, uh, help me also appreciate the, the impact on the oil and gas activity on BOP. I know there is the FDI component, but also there is the, the import component, a lot of it. So help me understand the impact on both sides. And finally, can we, ca are, you, are we able to disaggregate the contribution of the Gulf to remittances? It will be very important to give us that context. Hello, um, my name is Vincent Kasozi. I'm news editor, Sunny FM 88.2. Um, my colleague from Nation Media actually um, pointed out a question that I wanted to put to you, Dr. Mugume, about the value for money. Because um, uh, growing up in the 90s, uh, we used to use 20, 10 shillings uh, to buy foodstuffs. Now um, you need to give your kid uh, 2,000 shillings um, to buy stuff from the canteen. It's, it's, it's the kind of value for money that uh, I'm also failing to understand. Um, uh, a same note um, will get you um, uh, less stuff in the market than it, it, it did um, probably 15 years ago. So um, how does this relate to um, the Bank of Uganda's um, uh, attempt to um, put inflation under control and um, eventually um, helping improve real incomes in the economy. Yeah, so um, that's, that's an, um, an addition to um, his question, my, my colleague from Nation Media. So my other question, um, number two, uh, refers to um, uh, your uh, attempt to explain why the lending rate uh, does not uh, automatically or immediately follow um, uh, the, uh, the, the CBR. Um, I, I wanted to ask you whether or not uh, it, 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 it's got nothing to do with um, structural issues as opposed to uh, merely the uh, predatory capitalist behavior of banks that we fail to put um, uh, under control. Because we all know that uh, um, loans are either insured or they come with collateral. In fact, one of the most uh, valuable assets a bank has is its loan book. And as we've seen, um, probably with uh, investigations by parliament and sale of banks, the loan book is actually very, very uh, valuable. So, um, and then uh, you, you, you ex explained that um, lending rate while you were talking about um, access to, uh, the private access to capital, uh, sorry, to credit. Um, private access to credit. Um, to follow up that question, I hope I don't get too convoluted. Paid up um, capital for banks was increased um, drastically from, I don't know, maybe 5 million to 25 billion. Um, why was this done and has it got anything to do with um, accusations against the government uh, to limit local banks, and this has, in the end, um, led to a reduction of access to capital for locals, because, um, like I said before, foreign banks uh, ask to credit. I hope my questions have come across um, uh, clearly, and uh, yes, thank you very much, Dr. Mugun. Uh, Paul Busharizi, uh, The New Vision. Um, on the issue of lending on lending rates, it's, 
I'm sure it follows some uh, supply demand logic as well. W to what extent or to what extent can the Bank of Uganda help in the increase of um, savings into the bank? So if you have a lot of deposits in you know, the banks, despite all other factors, we'll have to find a way of shoveling that money out of the bank and therefore lending rates will come down. What is the scope that the Bank of Uganda has in, in, in pushing this? Thank you. Okay, we shall have those questions just for now. We shall have, let, we shall ask Dr. Mugumi and his team to answer them. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, within your packets are evaluation and registration forms. We would please remind you to fill these out. We'll be passing by to collect them. Over, you to, over to you, Dr. Mugumi and your team. promoted that I can sit and answer questions. Is that okay with everybody? Eh? Oh, is that okay? Eh. Now, they let me start with the simple one, and then my colleagues also will come in on the hard ones. <laughs> about uh, <laughs> lending interest rates. Uh, uh, the, what the first question was about what population do we use in terms of income per capita. We use the numbers by UBOS. You know very well UBOS is mandated for that. And I think it gives a uh, population of around 42 million uh, in 2021. So basically, that's the, uh, the population of Uganda we are using. The interesting question about the value of currency. Uh, uh, whether it is being eroded. Yeah, I agree with you, like, remember when we had the, the famous conversion, was it 87? And then we got the uh, Uganda dollar. After you you take, I think, one 100 shillings, they knock off 30%, and then they give you, even it was five shillings by then, it was really variable. But the question is, whether it is in Uganda, whether it is in the USA, so long as we say inflation, even if it is 2%, basically when we say inflation is 2% per year, you are saying the value of currency is declining by 2% per year. Do that cumulatively. So, <laughs> if we have said inflation between 1993 to 2021 has averaged 6.1, you are saying that every year, if you had you are 100 shillings. Now start mo moving 6.1% per year. You see that actually probably 100 shillings now cause the inflation has eaten it. And that's why we're emphasizing the best way to maintain the value of a currency is to have inflation stable. The lower the inflation, the more stable your currency is. So in other words, your money is not being eaten away by uh, by inflation. It is the same story. If you have been earning 1 million shillings and your salary has been 1 million for the last 5 years and inflation on average is, is say 5%. So you are saying that the move 5% of 1 million every year. So first year you move 5%. Whatever remains, the second year you move the same 5%. So to make you see that what you remain with as income and actually that's reflective of the value of currency has diminished, is going down. So basically, we are not saying inflation is zero, no. If inflation is zero, it means that the value of currency it remains constant. But so long as you have positive inflation, it automatically means that your value of the currency is declining. Now, that's one way of looking at in terms of Uganda shilling. But some another one can say, oh, hold on. But what, what about if I exchange it in terms of the dollar? So would the dollar be impacted by the same magnitude? The answer is no. Because inflation that affects the dollar is the U.S. inflation, not the Ugandan inflation. So you have to start looking at now. 
the more you export and less you import, the more dollars you attract, and therefore, in terms of how much money you get shillings can buy in dollars, becomes heavy. So there are different aspects of looking at the value of the currency and the erosion of the currency. I hope I have really uh, answered that one. Okay? Or import. I think I like that question. We have been talking about FDI in oil sector, but what about the imports related to oil investments? They are heavy. During uh, the next five years, the imports related uh, to oil sector are going to be very, uh, very high, and therefore, it is going to give us a big balance of payment deficit compared to the FDI. I know many people have said, but you see, investment is say 10 billion. But 10 billion, think about how much of that 10 billion is going to be on imports. You find that probably out of the 10 billion, more than 8 billion is going to do imports. So what is actually going to affect the economy is basically uh, less than say 2 billion. Basically, that is the story. So until the oil starts flowing, we are likely to see more demand for imports related to oil than even what FDI is, that is coming through. So that is really a valid question. Now, that's why I think where people have been saying, can the Ugandans benefit from investment in the oil sector? Yes, the, those are, I think, the government uh, initiatives, and I think they are going on well. Probably some of those will spill over into the economy. But to the extent that oil extraction is really import dependent, I think we are likely to see during this period, we are likely to see less in terms of the dollar inflows. Uh, I, then the learning interest rate. I like the question, the capitalist. I think this has been going <laughs> It is in the business to make money, to make a profit. That's a, fa a, fa a fact. Even a matroke trader goes there to make profit. You buy bananas from wherever you buy it. Actually, <laughs> you, uh, you, impo uh, you bring it to Kampala, you double the price, isn't it? So to make a profit. The same story with the commercial bank. But the question is, to what extent? Whether it is a foreign bank, whether it is a government-owned bank, so long as it is in the business of, uh, of uh, banking, intermediating between the savers and uh, borrowers, it is there basically to, produce, uh, to give a service, but also looking at the profit. However, the question is, is the profit orientation driving lending interest rate than the other structural factors. Now, that's really where the debate should be. If you look at every bank that is making a profit, is it, and, and therefore also charging interest rates, is the profit demand driving earning interest rates than the nature of the businesses he's dealing with? Let, let me, uh, there are banks, for example, in the case of Uganda, that deal with small, small, businesses, S uh, they called SMEs. And you know the nature, the death rate, the, to put it in a crude way, the death rate for these SMEs is very, very high. The one that survive after five years, after starting, is a very small number. So the, given that nature, you find that therefore a, a commercial bank that deals with that small client, those who the survival is is questionable within the two years. Obviously, they have to charge high lending interest. Why? Because they have to, uh, to follow the borrower. They have to make sure that uh, once you have got the money from a commercial bank, you are actually using it. If it is importing capital, you are importing capital. You know, by the way, there are some Ugandans who borrow money, and the next following day for a business, the following day you are in Dubai. Are, you, even I was shocked. There's one who, who stole money from a bank and went and did Kwanjura, two weddings actually, after stealing the money. And so when he was caught, he was saying, yeah, I went for introduction. So wh what do you do? The guy went for introduction after stealing the money. You can't tell, take the wives. <laughs> so what do you do? And uh, that's the nature. So <laughs> that's why I was saying you, since you can't sell the wives, 
and to recover the money, and the money is for a, 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 a saver, a commercial bank how to do, see how to cover it through lending interest rates. I mean, so those are the aspects we are talking about. I like the question of uh, what Bushari is asked. What is the role in terms of financial saving, financial education? I think really that's where the, uh, the emphasis uh, probably uh, uh, the central bank should put emphasis in, and that's what we are trying to do. So, so that once you borrow money, you know that you have borrowed. It is not a grant. It is not a donation. You have to pay back, and we have to use it for the particular businesses. Most of the businesses in Uganda, once they get the money, including uh, even development banks, they, people want to, uh, to divert the money. You get, uh, it comes from, I don't know if it's lack of education or whether it is basically <laughs> the nature, uh, you know, people think that a loan is a grant, I don't know, but basically it comes from say, the you know, financial inclusion and education, and I think that's really what uh, probably uh, we, we, are, we are trying to do uh, as Bank of Uganda. Now, is it something that can happen within one year? This is going to take, a, 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 you know, a, a period because education change of the behavior ATC uh, tend, uh, takes uh, uh, a while. So overall, when you look at the lending interest rates, I know, yes, actually, there are many banks in Uganda that make losses. Although they make losses, they are, you know, so th th that means that they are not making a profit. So it is not therefore the profit orientation that is causing lending interest rates since they are making losses. Okay? So lending interest rates is beyond the capitalistic nature. Well, as I said, whether it is a government bank loan, uh, sorry, a bank institution, and you, you, I mean, we are all here, we are media, you can go to them and ask them how much I, are you know government institution? Um, you ask each one of them what is your lending interest rate. If you find it as a government institution is lower than, say, the so-called foreign bank, then you can debate. But in most cases, you find that even the, <laughs> the, so, uh, the government-owned institutions have the same uh, lending interest rate structure like the others. So it is not necessarily the capitalist nature of the banking si uh, system. Uh, I agree with you. The way only to lower, one of the aspects to lower uh, lending interest rate, increasing savings. Uh, as I, I told you, in 2020, when there was COVID, many people increased their savings. Now, Omicron, Omicron came, uh, you know, it is no longer a threat. People have the same. The saving interest rate, the saving increase on annual growth in 2020 was above 20. Now we are talking about 4%. Simply because once the uncertainty started easing in terms of Omicron, people now offloaded uh, in terms of, uh, of spending rather than saving. So the more savings we have, the more liquidity in the, in the commercial bank, and therefore the more even if government takes some, at least you have a, a sufficient amount that can go to, uh, to lending. I agree with you that that's one way, and I think financial inclusion aspect and education will go a long way into that. I leave the paid up capital uh, to Robert. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Robert Mbabazize, the Director of Financial Stability Department. Um, now, this question, I think, is in two parts. There is the question that says, why did we increase the minimum paid-up capital? But also, there was another interesting part, which says, uh, or alleges, that Bank of Uganda seems not to want local people to open what? Banks. Let me, first, uh, let me start with the first part of the question. Uh, I think the key issue here is that all of us are interested in having a banking sector that is very strong, that is resilient. Resilience means that it can handle shocks like COVID-19 successfully. And also a banking sector that is able to support economic growth going forward. That is the main reason why we are 
thinking of increasing the minimum paid up capital. Minimum paid up capital that we're increasing means two things. It means the capital that a person needs in order to apply to open a commercial bank or a credit institution or an MDI. But it also means that once that institution is open, on an ongoing basis, it has to maintain that capital. Now, we are increasing the capital for commercial banks from 25 billion to 150 billion. For credit institutions, which is tier two, from um, 1 billion to 25 billion. And for the microfinance deposit taking institutions, which is tier three, from 500 million to 5 billion. Now, let's disaggregate some of these uh, factors that I'm uh, talking about. In the first instance, the capital of these institutions has taken a long time to be revised. For example, for MDIs, this is tier three, the capital was first set in 2003. It's now almost 20 years, what, later. And they are still operating with the same level of what? Of minimum capital. So the, oh, the revision of this capital is overdue, in other words. Uh, if you look at the economic growth during that period, the economy has been growing on average about 6-7% over those, uh, that period. But also if you look at inflation. So it means therefore that while capital has remained relatively unchanged, the economy on the other hand has been what? Growing. So we want also banks to have higher capital that can support uh, growth. Then thirdly, uh, you, we want our banking sector to be competitive within the region. Now, if you look at what is happening across the region, you realize that in Rwanda, they increased the capital for banks in 2019 to about $25 million. In Zambia, it's about $100 million. Kenya has a proposal to increase capital for banks to about $50 million. It is also ongoing. Now, you guys, you are the ones complaining that our banking sector is dominated by foreign what? Banks. We also need our banking sector to be strong enough to compete what? Regionally. Otherwise, it will lead to what we call arbitrage in economics, where our banking sector is so weak that all the weak borrowers in the region run to where? Uh, to Uganda. Um, then, of course, um, let me turn to the second part of the question. Does this increase mean that Bank of Uganda does not want Ugandans' own banks? This is, a, in my opinion, a fallacy. Uh, I think my colleague from the Commercial Banking Department is here. As he will confirm to you, the capital for MDIs, tier three, has been at 500 million shillings for 20 years, almost, since 2003. How many applications have we received from Ugandans to open an MDI. Because you would agree with me that there are many Ugandans who can afford 500 million what? Shillings. So in my opinion, the problem is not the capital. Okay? And it is wrong to say that by increasing capital, we are trying to lock out Ugandans. Because even when capital was low, how many Ugandans were applying to open what? Financial institutions. The, what do the numbers say? Not very many. So in brief, uh, I think, unless Hanning wants to add on, but that's what I have to say. Um, th th thanks a, lo a lot, Robert. I, I think you've said literally what I would have said, but um, I, I can add one or two things on, on the issue of uh, locking out Ugandans uh, from the financial system. As, as um, my colleague indicated, w we have a tiered approach to licensing financial institutions in Uganda. We have the tier one institutions, which are the commercial banks. We have uh, tier two institutions, which are credit institutions, and tier three institutions, which are the microfinance deposit taking institutions. And then we also have tier fours, the other financial services providing institutions that are not yet regulated by Bank of Uganda, but, but they offer financial services like circles, village um, and loan savings and loan associations. 
Now, the reason we have this tiered approach is because we want as many Ugandans to get involved in the financial sector as possible. If, if we join hands, 10, 10 of us, and we raise 50 million as Ugandans, we can set up a micro microfinance deposit taking institution. You operate over time, you graduate, you become a tier two, you continue operations, you, you graduate and become a commercial bank. Increasing capital requirements, as my colleague has explained, is not in any way intended to lock out anyone. Because even with the tiered approach we have, uptake has been very low. I, I think uh, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, on the issue of savings, there's someone who had a question about savings. Uh, there's someone from NPSD who would like to supplement. Over here. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alex Ochan, uh, Head of Financial Inclusion at the Bank of Uganda. Uh, there was a question, and I think uh, Dr. Mogume right, uh, responded to it. I just want to supplement. Uh, the question was from Paul, that to what extent can be of help in mobilizing savings in banks? Now, I'll address it in two ways. Uh, one is that I think uh, mobilization of savings is more of uh, a joint effort that requires both uh, the central bank and also the media houses uh, to be part of. Now, on the demand side, we have, uh, sorry, on the supply side, we have the National Financial Inclusion Strategy that addresses uh, several constraints on the supply side. And uh, the Bank of Uganda, the Secretariat for, for the Strategy. And one of the areas that we're looking at is, uh, for, exa for example, agent banking. Uh, that is spreading its roots uh, in, in, in most of the corners of the country. And we expect that the services provided should enable uh, the population open bank accounts and also save uh, more conveniently with uh, uh, the different banks. But also there is an effort in trying to link up uh, the village uh, savings and loan associations. As, as you know, they're quite uh, a vehicle in mobilizing savings in the rural areas with the formal uh, financial sector, in this case, uh, commercial banks. We've already started seeing uh, some benefits in terms of uh, the banks that are doing this, uh, having a lot of uh, registrations from uh, the VSLAs. Now, on the demand side, which is basically addressing the constraints on the side of uh, the population, as mentioned by Dr. Mugume, we have a strategy called the Strategy of Financial Literacy uh, 2019 to 2022, uh, 2024, sorry, and has two things or three, if I may mention. One of them is uh, the financial literacy training of trainers that empowers uh, those who are interested in uh, spreading the gospel of financial education to the population to become trainers. And I think uh, from this meeting, I foresee ourselves uh, having a training specifically for the media houses. Uh, the second one, we also do conduct regular financial literacy training uh, centered around seven areas of uh, personal financial management, savings, loans, uh, insurance, investment, and financial services for providers. During the COVID period, we did a lot of training across the country looking at, uh, because we couldn't have uh, a direct approach, so we used the radios. And if you're right to recall, last year we had uh, commemorated the World Savings Day and all that is uh, aimed at promoting savings or moving new savings from under the mattress to the formal financial sector. Uh, I just wanted to provide a bit of clarification. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. As you can see, gentlemen and ladies of the press, we have a wealth of information right here at the bank. So any questions that you may possibly have regarding the Bank of Uganda's mandate that may be or may not be related to Dr. Mugume's presentation, I suggest you take this opportunity to ask them now. For those following us on social media, our hashtag is BOUMPF. I will also take questions off social media, so our social media team will forward them to me. So now for the second round of five questions, please raise your hand and the microphone will come to you. Again, please remember to introduce yourself and the media house you're representing. Thank you. Uh, 
my name is Ali Twaha and I work with uh, New Vision. Just two questions. Mr. Mugumi was quite clear that there's no chance of further easing of the policy stance. But mine is really on uh, what are the chances of giving, you know, direction to, to, to commercial banks, I mean the listed commercial banks, to start paying dividends again to, to investors. I understand there's, there, there was a deferment on, on, on payments of dividends, and I, w I would want to get a clear picture of when you will start allowing them to, to pay investors again. Uh, I understand there's a, a system up stress test that started around December, and there's no there's not been any communication on, you know, where the the outcomes of, of that stress test, depending on, on on the performance of the banks. Then two is uh, on uh, I was seeing some of the products that some players in that were recently licensed. You know, by following the National Payment System Act coming into force, one of them is a, is a safe border, and, and the products they're they're trying to to give Ugandans. The, the the act sort of gave them the chance to morph into some sort of small banks out there. I just wanted to understand what you know, what kind of licenses did they get from, from the central bank rate? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Lubeke Emanuel from Jumuiya Media and also DW Radio and TV. Uh, my question is about the crude situations. Dr. Adam Mugume, he mentioned issues about risks, and I was thinking about one of the other hidden risks, and that is cartels in the economy. For example, if we have fuel dealers uh, positioning themselves to you know, hike fuel prices and stick them there, we have uh, a group, of uh, a group of rice importers uh, trying to position themselves to control the rice prices. Is it possible for the Bank of Uganda to, to intervene in such situations to fight cartels? Thank you. Okay. Shall we say that is the last of the questions? Okay, then over to you, Dr. Mugume. Then we will wrap up the inaugural Monetary Policy Forum. It is good that none of the questions are to me. <laughs> one question was a dividend. The guy who doesn't want to pay is this one. Uh, so <laughs> uh, the one of the testing is in Babazize. They are here. They can answer for themselves. They are of age. <laughs> <laughs> Even the safe border question is the uh, wise one. So basically, payment. Yeah, but they were talking about that. I said, so they can answer for themselves. They are of age. Uh, then the cartels, uh, the question of the cartels, what can the central bank do? Now, that's where sometimes I also tend to believe in what you, as an economist, not as Bank of Uganda staff, that sometimes I think <laughs> too much openness without regulation can also be equally deadly. I agree with that. I'm not saying that we should control. But the question is, like, uh, recently when a fuel prices jump to 10,000 per liter. You see that that's where you need a regulator, a strong regulator, to say, hold on, 
You can't all of a sudden. <laughs> I mean, you can't say the, uh, the supply is limited. No, but you, wha- how can supply be? What are you saying then if it's limited? America means that there was supply, you're overcharging. I think that's, uh, that's why I agree that they, they need, yes, there is a need for liberalization of the markets, but there is also need for a regulator to ensure that once you have uh, a market system, it is not necessarily abused by. Uh, so that's where I think I tend to agree. Like the cartel. I'm not sure whether there are really cartels in the market of oil or whatever it is, but the question I think is uh, uh, if there is no effective competition in any market, at least from e- economist perspective, that warrants, uh, warrants public intervention. So that means that if there is monopolistic tendencies, if there is a uh, sharp cut, uh, oligopoly tendencies, that's where uh, the real regulation comes in. So I'm in agreement that where there is a cartel, probably where we see there is a need for regulation, I think it will come uh, up front. Whether it is there in the oil sector, I'm not sure it is there apart from, but also people, if if there are too many oil uh, uh, petrol stations, if one is charging at, uh, at 6,000, why do you get stuck to that one? Can't you go to another one that charges 5,000? Are you married to that person until you die? <laughs> Even people now these days divorce. So uh, what is it? Why can't you divorce share and go to Total? Or why do you uh, remain on Mogas as if <laughs> the Pope said, no, never divorce? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Once they, it is also the same. If a commercial bank overcharges you, you are not married to it. Go away, you go to another one. For God's sake. And there are those who believe that for us, our bank is this one. The church said so. Okay, go there and they overcharge you. That's your business. So, <laughs> but the information is already available. That this bank, that's why, for example, the commercial bank, that's why you print charges, interest rates per bank. Why do you stick to one that overcharges you? Why don't you divorce it? And then you go for forgiveness. I'm a, uh, I'm a pastor. I can give you what they call it when you when you go to a priest. Repentance. There is no. There are those things we used to call in 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 Catholic Church in Unyankole what they used to call Sakiri Rego. There are no sins called the Sakiri Rego. <laughs> For us in Unyankole we used to call it Sakiri Rego. I don't know what they, it is in English. So that means that there is no sin that you can't be forgiven. You can divorce and go where they don't overcharge you. So that's where the market system needs to operate. Look at who is charging who. Even in the ma- ma- Matoke market, you will see where, who is charging Matoke at high, high price. You go to where they charge you race. You can't get stuck to one person as if we are mean. So it is up to real individuals whether they are regulators or not. So it happens, I, I agree with you, Although there is a need for a bit of regulation, but I think also as consumers, we need to be really, to be inquisitive. What is the, the market information? You can see the market information, the prices all over. You stick to where, you go where, where they, uh, they, uh, they charge you rates. Can Bank, bank of Uganda has its own regulator on, uh, on the banks. If we see a cartel behavior in the banking system, I'm sure for the ba- Bank of Uganda, we take action. And sometimes we go in to commercial banks to see whether they are really a cartel system in the central ba- in the commercial banks. But outside there in the oil sector or Matoke market, ETC, it goes beyond the central bank. I think if we will try to go pop our nose in that business, I think they would tell us, uh, please go back to <laughs> your currency. This is not your area. Stick to your area. Mbabazize and Waiswa. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mugume. Um, there was a question on uh, the restriction on dividends. Uh, it is true that at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in April 2020, uh, the governor announced that uh, commercial banks, uh, credit institutions, and MDIs would not be allowed to pay dividends until further advised by Bank of Uganda. It is also true that this restriction remains in place. Uh, I think it is important to go back and ask ourselves why was this restriction put in place? It was put in place in order to ensure that these institutions build up 
strong capital in order to withstand the COVID-19 pandemic. Because we all know that during that pandemic, uh, economic growth reduced, as Dr. Mugume pointed out in his presentation, there was a risk that because many people were under lockdown, their businesses were not working, therefore they were unable to pay their what? Their loans, okay? Now, a bank, of course, is a business, but in our regulation, if a loan is not paid, the bank has to write it off from the capital. And at that point, we were worried that the non-performing loans may increase to a level that might overwhelm the capital of some of the banks, especially those that entered the COVID pandemic without strong capital what? buffers. So, has the restriction worked? Yes, it has worked. If you look at the capital buffers of banks, they've increased from about 19% before COVID to about 23% now. The NPL ratio has remained almost unchanged. But it is also important to look at this restriction together with the other measures put in place by Bank of Uganda because all of them are related. Dr. Mugume talked about the credit relief measures where we allowed borrowers to have some room where they are not paying loans during the lockdown. Because if you're in lockdown, you don't have income. But we, this also meant that we allowed banks not to write off these loans. If a bank is not writing off these loans from its capital, why would it be paying dividends to its what? Shareholders. The two do, that does not make sense. Now, the COVID relief measures ended in September. However, we still have targeted what? Measures in place for education and hospitality. So as long as these credit relief measures for education and hospitality remain in place, it may be necessary also to have in place some form of dividend what? Restriction. Okay. Because as I've explained, you cannot be giving some forbearance shareholders where you allow them not to write off their losses, but at the same time you are allowing them to pay themselves what? Dividends. It doesn't make sense. However, we also require banks to do what we call a forward-looking internal capital adequacy assessment on, a uh, on an annual basis and therefore demonstrate to us that they have put in place additional what? Uh, plans to increase their capital so as to warrant the payment of these dividends. So all I can say is that uh, Bank of Uganda will continue to assess the COVID-19 pandemic-related risks and also to uh, change or revisit this policy as the economic recovery evolves. Uh, there was a small question on the bottom-up stress testing. Uh, the bottom-up stress testing exercise, as the gentleman rightly pointed out, uh, started in October last year, and we are on course. It is important to note that this is the first bottom-up stress test that Bank of Uganda is conducting ever. But essentially, it is a macro stress test where we are trying to assess the resilience of banks and as we ask ourselves if the COVID-19 pandemic were to reoccur with the strongest lockdown that we saw, as Dr. Mugume pointed out earlier, have the banks, for example, developed enough capacity in terms of capital buffers and liquid assets to withstand uh, that shock. So the exercise itself is going to run from next month uh, using data as at December. It is important for banks to use their audited accounts and we shall report the results around April of uh, this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, Alex, a uh, question on safe border, please. Yeah, th thank, thank you very much. The last question was uh, some products coming up like safe border. Now, uh, since March 2021, when um, the implementing regulations for the NPS Act uh, was passed or gazetted, uh, the Bank of Uganda has licensed a total of about 14 uh, institutions as payment service providers or payment systems operators. Now, uh, one of the licensed institutions is Guinness Tech, which is trading as a safe border in the market. 
Uh, it's licensed as a payment service provider, stroke payment uh, systems operator for small value funds transfer. So it's licensed by the central bank. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, all. Uh, <coughs> can you please give uh, all our panelists a big round of applause? And also to you who have attended, both online and in person, this being the first inaugural monetary policy forum, we are going to take back what you have said, what you have told us in the evaluation forms, so that we can make it better. So as you all go, I hope you all go safe. Please do not quote Dr. Mugume on marriage. You can quote him on the economy, but not on marriage. Uh, so have a good day. And we shall continue to pick up the evaluation and registration forms. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you still have a registration form, 